Isaiah 53, verse number 10. Now watch this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise it. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Whoops. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, here's the question. If the body of Jesus was the offering for our sins, how could his soul also be an offering for our sin? Now, your heretics will say, well, it burned in hell. Well, is that proper Bible doctrine? Did he, did he mean it when he said it is finished? He meant it when he said it is finished. The punishment for our sin was complete on the cross. He finished it on the cross. But the Bible says that his soul was an offering for sin. If his soul burns, then that means it wasn't finished on the cross. So his soul can't burn, but his soul has to do something about our sins. It has to be a part of the offering for our sins. Now how was his soul an offering, a part of the offering for our sins along with his body? Obviously his spirit had nothing to do with it. His spirit went back to heaven, went to the hands of the Father. But his soul and his body are related to the offering of our sins. And I'm sitting there at my desk thinking, there's got to be an answer to this. I know that his body was broken for our sins. He said that's what was broken. The Bible says it, that it, they took our sins in his body. His body, his body, his body. What about that soul? And then the Lord brought me back, my mind back, to a special passage of Scripture in the book of Leviticus. Go to Leviticus 16. And I want to show you what the body and the soul of Jesus did concerning our sins. In relation to taking our sins away. Go to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16, we find the teaching, the law concerning the scapegoat. Y'all heard of, you, I know you've heard the phrase scapegoat. Well, that guy was just a scapegoat. You know, he, it's the guy, he took the punishment that somebody else, somebody else did something wrong, but that guy paid for it. He was the scapegoat. That's actually a biblical term. It's a very biblical principle. Look at Leviticus 16, verse number five. Leviticus 16, verse five. And he, he's talking about here, Aaron, the high priest, and this will be the law for all the high priests from this point on concerning this issue of the scapegoat. Watch this. He, Aaron, or the high priest, whoever he'll be, shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock for the sin offering. That's, that's the, uh, the bovine that he sacrifices which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take two goats, the two goats, watch this, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord. That means that goat is going to die. And the other lot for the scapegoat, not to be sacrificed, not to be killed. I'll show you that in just a minute. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. That's a picture of the body of Christ. He's killed. Verse 10, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented, watch that next word, alive before the Lord. But watch this, to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Two goats, one dies, he's sacrificed, he's, his blood is shed. The other one is going to be let go. He's going to live but he's going to be a scapegoat for their sins. Look at verse number 15 with me. Then shall he kill the goat for the sin offering. That would be a picture of the body of Christ. 
That is for the people. And bring his blood, like the blood of Christ, within the veil, like the blood of Christ. This is a picture of the body of Christ. And do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before, uh, excuse me, yeah, upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So what happened with Christ's blood in heaven? Just like this goat. It was sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven. This is a picture of the body of Christ. Now look at verse number 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat. This is the goat that died. This is the goat that physically, his blood was shed. He physically died, a picture of the body of Christ, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And we have made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. There's a second goat, but he's alive. The first goat, he's dead. He is, his blood was shed. But this second goat is brought live, alive. Now, if the dead goat, the, the, the one that his blood was shed, if that represents the body of Christ, what would the living goat? Remember, with Jesus, his spirit was it connected to the sin? Spirit went back to heaven. But his body took our sins and his soul. And Isaiah 53, 53 was an offering for sin. So it's his body and soul that are connected to taking our sins away. The body took the beating. The body shed its blood. That's the first goat. So this second goat, this, this goat that doesn't die, that must be a picture of the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, a picture of the soul of Christ, and confess over him, a picture of the soul of Christ, watch this, all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. Notice how I keep saying all their sins, all their transgressions. I, like, I like the fact that Jesus took care of all of our sins. He didn't just take care of some of them. He took care of all of our sins. So he's confessing. He grabs this goat by the head. He gets down and he confesses all of the sins of God's people on the head of that goat. All the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions, all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, that living goat, which is a picture of the soul of Christ. Watch this. And shall send him. This, this goat's going somewhere. Remember the dead goat, he stayed right there in Jerusalem where he was killed. But the living goat had to go somewhere. He's going somewhere. Shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And what could the wilderness be a picture of? And the goat, which is a picture of the soul of Christ, shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So what happens is, they pick a strong man, a fit man of Israel, a man who can travel a long distance, and he'll lead that scapegoat out as far as he can walk to a place where nobody's around and nobody can see and nobody's going to find him. And he'll take that scapegoat way out there and let him go. You know, the Bible never says that scapegoat dies. That, it never says the scape, scapegoat suffers. Not one drop of the scapegoat is ever shed. The Bible never says it's shed. It doesn't. It's not meant to suffer. It's to take, take the sins away as far, maybe as the east is from the west. We'll say it like that. He's taking those sins away. A fit man took him out of there. I, I got to wonder who that fit man was. I don't know, but I'm guessing it's one of two people. It's either the Holy Ghost it could be the Holy Ghost because the Bible says it was the Holy Ghost that raised Jesus up from the dead. It could be the Holy Ghost. It could be a picture, that fit man could be a picture of Jesus himself taking our sins all the way out to where nobody else was. That first goat, he was an offering for sin because he died. His blood was shed, a picture of the body of Christ. That scapegoat, he didn't die. 
He wasn't killed. He wasn't punished. He didn't suffer. Now, now let's get technical. Technically speaking, that physical goat actually died in that wilderness. He was going to wander until he died. Maybe got killed by a wild animal. Every picture, every type breaks down somewhere. But there's a difference between that scapegoat and our scapegoat. Jesus didn't go anywhere else to die. He didn't go somewhere else to suffer. He suffered once on the cross for us and that was it. What his soul did was took all the sins, that sacrifice of the body of Christ, his soul took all of our sins and went far, far dis in the distance to hell where nobody else was, where nobody else could find your sins and my sins. He went where nobody was and he dug your sins and my sins off into hell. What was Jesus doing in hell? He was getting rid of my sin. That's what he was doing. He was removing my sin as far as the east is from the west. He was putting our sins behind the back of God where he could never see them again. He got rid of our sins. His soul didn't suffer in hell. His soul was the scapegoat that took all of our sins far, far away. So next time you hear somebody, one of these heretics say that Jesus, he, he burned in hell. No, friend, we believe in the finished work of the cross. But we do believe that his soul was that scapegoat, an offering for sin in the sense that it bore our sins. Didn't shed any blood, didn't suffer, wasn't punished, but took all of our sins far, far away where we'll never come in contact with them again. Praise his holy name. So Jesus did not burn in hell.